for those of you who work on the Intelligence Committee, Committees and, and the authorizing committees and the committees of jurisdiction for the Patriot Act, you know the, the details of what's written in these three provisions that are expiring. Um, but what you haven't had yet is the privilege of just working the day-to-day -day, um, uh, day -day, uh, biorhythm of a, a local DA or a federal prosecutor. And the tools that we use, and, I, and I've um, used them routinely, and you know this from being at the DA working with assistant U.S. attorneys, is that you know, without having access to business records broadly defined, Without having the ability to tap somebody's phone, uh, a drug dealer, a murderer, a rapist, you name it, uh, you, you're not going to be able to build your case. And prior to 9-11, um, there were uh, tools that local prosecutors and certainly federal prosecutors had and used routinely and still do to this day that allowed them to gather evidence, the type of evidence we're talking about, uh, in their cases. And so for those of us who who worked as AUSAs, um, it, it, we're sort of at a head-scratching moment when we hear all this caterwauling about uh, uh, extending the business records uh, provision of the Patriot Act or roving wiretaps. And, le and let me walk you through the three provisions. And for those of you who've been either in the offices that have had the pen on these uh, or others, it, it may be a little uh, slow for you. You can check your BlackBerry. Uh, but I, I want to make sure that everyone in the room understands that there's nothing new in these provisions except that now we're just giving these tools to national security investigators. But we're also putting in extraordinary um, oversight and court scrutiny and, and, and requirements at the front end to use these tools that federal prosecutors just don't have. So Takeaway one, these are tools that criminal investigators have had uh, since the mid to early 80s. Uh, and two, uh, we finally gave it to national security investigators, but added substantial civil liberties and court oversight. Well, let me walk you, th you through them. The first, and I've written about it at Heritage. You can go on to heritage.org. Uh, there's a lot of material there that we've written about uh, on the Patriot Act over the years. But the first is so-called roving wiretaps. And here's the concept. Uh, dumb criminals get caught. Smart ones tend not to get caught, usually. Um, and what criminals do, uh, terrorists are no different, uh, is uh, they communicate with each other uh, if they're going to work uh, in a gang or work with other people to get away with their crimes. Uh, and they've gotten pretty good at it. They have used burn phones, which are the little cheapy phones you can buy at Union Station uh, for 50 bucks. You get 20 minutes of talking, and then they throw it away. You don't have to sign up with a cell phone company, you don't have to have Verizon or AT&T in that ever running debate. You can just get the phone, talk, call your bubba, get the job done. Terrorists know this too. And so in 1986, uh, uh, your bosses or former bosses passed a law that allowed federal prosecutors uh, to uh, track the person, not the actual phone. And technology has evolved over the years. Um, and now we allow for roving wiretaps in the criminal context. So you could not do your job as a DEA agent if you didn't do roving wiretaps, period. No, no gang or mafia prosecutions would ever go down successfully without a roving wiretap, period. Um, what we've done now in the, in, in the national security context, um, in Section 206 of the Patriot Act, the so-called roving wiretap section, is give national security investigators the ability to go to the FISA court and uh, up front um, ask for permission of a judge. So the Congress has inserted a judge between the investigator and the ultimate uh, yes or no of whether the wiretap is going to be allowed. Um, um, ask for permission to follow the person. So no matter how many phones he goes through, we're following this guy over here. Look at him. He looks shady. All right? Um, so we don't care how many phones they get. Um, now, one of the myths, because that's part of my homework assignment, talk about the myths. You do have to have probable cause. That's written right into the statute. So the judge, uh, the standard that the government has to prove is that probable cause um, to believe that the, quote, person's actions could have the effect of thwarting their actions by moving from phone to phone uh, have the effect of thwarting interception from a specified facility. Um, 
quote, the actions of the target of the application may have the effect of thwarting the identification of a specified person. So in other words, they have to be on the lam. Um, now, it makes sense. Um, by the way, um, uh, there aren't these protections built into uh, standard criminal investigations. Um, a grand jury, for example, can issue a subpoena. Uh, and I know I've put tons of cases in front of the grand jury here when I was assistant U.S. attorney in Washington and asked for subpoenas for all sorts of things, including uh, roving wiretaps. And there's no judge involved. In theory, there's a judge who will look at the, the subpoena later on, but rarely does it, does it happen. Um, what are the safeguards? Le you know, you, you don't hear much about the myths, the safeguards that are out there. Um, first, there has to be probable cause to believe that the target is a foreign power. Um, secondly, agents must demonstrate probable cause to believe that, quote, each of the facilities or places at which the electronic surveillance is directed uh, or is being used is by a foreign power or agent of a foreign power. Um, and then next, this is key, minimum, minimization procedures have to be put into place uh, to ensure that the private in information about innocent Americans uh, is not collected, retained, or disseminated. That doesn't apply in standard criminal investigations. In fact, we're usually talking about Americans, and we usually supply it and disseminate it through discovery. But these extra layers of protection are included. Um, now, you hear some thoughtful people like Senator Mike Lee and others express concern that some of these provisions are unconstitutional, and I think that merits debate. Um, and we don't have a Supreme Court decision yet on whether this provision is constitutional, but I believe if we ever got there, we would, because uh, pop quiz time. Which federal circuit is the most overturned uh, in, by the Supreme Court? Correct. And none other than the Ninth Circuit in the United States versus Petty has ruled uh, that, at least in the Title III context of roving wiretaps, there's, quote, virtually no possibility of abuse or mistake, unquote, given those safeguards. Well, the safeguards in Section 206 are above and beyond those in the Title III context. So I'm relatively confident uh, that we're going to have, if we have a Supreme Court decision on it, that it will be held to be constitutional. Let's move on to the business records uh, section. Uh, opponents of this uh, and civil libertarians uh, who, who, in my opinion, take it a little too far um, uh, are critical of Section 215, and they call it the library provision. You always hear the library provision. Um, and, you know, bold librarians, I guess that's an oxymoron, uh, bold librarians have expressed concern. Well, th there's probably a good reason for them to express concern. The fact of the matter is business records are the bread and butter of standard criminal prosecutions. Don't have, you can't have access to business records. That's pawn receipts, receipts from Home Depot, um, you name it. Uh, as a criminal prosecutor, you can't make your case usually. You just can't do it. And by the way, in the standard criminal context, when I would go to the grand jury, I would say, well, you know, um, so-and-so over here, uh, he, you know, allegedly offed his wife. Uh, and he made some very strange purchases at Home Depot over in Seven Corners. I want to go, I want a subpoena, ladies and gentlemen of the grand jury, uh, to pull his credit card receipts and uh, the, his account information from Home Depot. You all say yes. I issue the subpoena to, to Home Depot. I get the information and I get it from Visa immediately. That's standard gumshoe prosecution 101 in the criminal context. Prior to the Patriot Act being authorized and this provision specifically being authorized national security investigators didn't have that tool can you imagine i mean when national security investigators do their case build their cases they need to have access to the same sort of thing tangible items uh, that standard criminal investigators need to have when they're building their cases they're not so dissimilar um, so first off it can apply to americans um, uh, but again, uh, your bosses uh, inserted the judge here in the middle of things. So whereas in the criminal context, I can just go to you guys in the grand jury and get my subpoena for the business records, in the FISA, in, in the FISA context, business records, you have to go uh, to uh, the judge. The FISA court may issue an order that directs a third party to produce, quote, 
any tangible things, including books, records, papers, documents, and other items, where there is, quote, reasonable grounds to believe that the tangible things sought are relevant to an authorized investigation, unquote. So whereas I can pretty much ask for a subpoena for virtually anything that the grand jury will give me, and trust me, they'll give you whatever you're asking for in most cases. Here you have a neutral and detached magistrate, a federal judge, um, who is uh, in the middle and can say no and, and do say no uh, quite frequently. What are the safeguards above and beyond what a criminal investigator would have the standard AUSA? There are many, and they are key, and this bats down a lot of the myths that are out there. One, Section 215, the business record section, can only be used in national security investigations, period. That doesn't apply in the criminal context. We can use it for all sorts of things. Two, you've got to go before the FISA court and convince them that they're entitled to it. Again, as I mentioned, the U.S. attorney doesn't have to do that. You just go to the grand jury, ask them for the subpoena, and you issue it, period. I've never had a grand jury say no to a subpoena request. Uh, and I don't know any of my colleagues who have either. Third, uh, unlike uh, in the criminal context that an assistant U.S. attorney would have to deal with, at the FISA context in this section, there are minim minimization procedures required that protect the privacy of innocent Americans. Usually, in the criminal context, it's always Americans. Fourth, the Patriot Act forbids the government from investigating an American, quote, solely upon the basis of activities protected by the First Amendment to the Constitution, unquote. We don't have that in the criminal context. Four, uh, fifth, um, there are heightened protections built in, right into the act, black and white, uh, when uh, investigators are seeking materials that are sensitive, like medical records uh, and uh, libraries or bookstore records. All right? We don't have that provision at all. In fact, if we did, it would slow down criminal investigations big time. Uh, and fifth, unlike the criminal context, uh, and this is key, there's robust congressional oversight. Uh, and the government must, quote, fully inform, unquote, the House and Senate Intelligence Committees. You all on those committees uh, may know whether that fully informed is actually happening the way it should. Uh, that's a subject for a different time. Now. What are the constitutional concerns here? Uh, there's a long line of Supreme Court cases that confirms that there is, quote, no reasonable expectation of privacy, unquote, in the information a person conveys to businesses and other third parties. And so I'm relatively confident that should this section be tested and go all the way up to the Supreme Court, given not only the similarity between the criminal context, but the extra protections built in, that it's going to be held uh, constitutional in, in those Law nerds out there, I would refer you to Smith versus Maryland and United States versus Miller. Let me touch the lone wolf provision. And when you're thinking lone wolf, think that nut job in Germany uh, last week who went off, went on the Air Force bus and was was often people. First off, this does not apply to Americans. Okay, so put that one aside. The other two can apply to Americans. This one may not apply to Americans. Uh, secondly. <clears throat> Why should we have a lone wolf? Don't we have enough in these other provisions? No, we don't. What national security investigators will tell you is that um, uh, they, they may not have yet enough information to formally link a person to a foreign terrorist organization. Because early on in an investigation, you may decide not have enough information. Um, so it's, a, first of all, an evidentiary problem. Is there, is there enough shreds of information out there to use the other two sections? Probably not, and that's where Lone Wolf would kick in. Um, it's difficult for investigators to establish that a given suspect is a member of or otherwise, otherwise has ties to a foreign organization, especially early on in an investigation. And second, and I think this is what Frank and others who, who have spent a lot of time in this area talk about, is the danger of entrepreneurial terrorism. Um, this guy in Germany is a perfect example. Um, so far, at least what we've read publicly, is that he has no known ties to a, a foreign terrorist organization, although he's motivated by, by them. Um, and so, re re oh, let's step back. Remember what Napolitano said recently? She said, quote, the terrorist threat facing our country has evolved significantly in the last 10 years and continues to involve 
We now face a threat environment where violent extremism is not defined or contained by international borders. She's talking about solitary actors. That's why we need the lone wolf uh, provision. Um, and so I'm going to stop there. You may have questions. Um, I will only say that there are um, robust civil liberties protections built into this provision as well. Court approvals required up front, uh, and, and the target has to have a foreign nexus to international terrorism. So it wouldn't even apply to a foreign terrorist in the United States engaged in an act of domestic terrorism. So it's a very narrow, narrowly defined tool, uh, and a tool that at least for now needs to be uh, renewed uh, for a, a period of time. So I'll stop there and answer any of your questions that you may have at this time. Thank you. Kelly, thank you very much. Uh